Hi guys, Will Terry here, and this video is going to be called How Much Should I Charge for My Art? Which is the wrong question. Another question that would be wrong would be What's the Going Rate? Um, I get asked this question a lot here on YouTube and on Facebook and Twitter and uh, and in email, and I wanted to go over that. It's This video is actually going to be kind of a remake from a video that I did a few years ago, but I want to revisit this subject and kind of give you some of the ideas and some of the, the strategies that I use. Um, so the first thing that you should probably try to do is see if you can get information from your potential client. So let's say someone's asking you to illustrate a children's book and let's say um, you say, well, how much money do you have? And they tell you, well, the most I could pay is like 500 bucks. And at that point, you probably realize that they're not serious and they really don't know how much work goes into a children's book because there's probably 20 or 25 illustrations that you have to do, including a cover and there's just no way you can do that for 500 bucks. The cool thing is you now have that information and you know that they're not really a serious client. If they say 10,000, even 5,000, something in that range, even for some people, one or 2,000. For my first book, I did for $1,000 uh, way back when. So, but having that and getting that information is, is critical. If they tell you they can pay you $8,000, you can say, well, I really need nine, but you know that you're only asking incrementally for just a little bit more. But a thousand dollars to you means a lot. So, getting that kind of information up front is truly critical. I want to talk about what happens when your client says, "I want you to tell me what your price is." You know, just submit an offer back to me. Tell me how much you will do this for, and that gets a lot more tricky. And that's where I get a lot of questions. Okay. So, um, let's see, where are we? Okay, let's talk about your average children's book. So I'm just going to use my Photoshop document here as my whiteboard. Let's say you've got the average children's book assignment, okay? So like I mentioned, uh, you could be asked or offered, or some people could, could actually think that $500 is a lot. Some people could could be offered five hundred dollars. I do know people who have been offered five hundred dollars to do a children's book. I know people that have been offered a thousand dollars. In fact, like I said, I did my first children's book for a thousand dollars. I know people who have done children's books for all of these prices: three thousand, forty five hundred, six thousand. One of my first picture books I got for nine thousand um, dollars. I've gotten as much as twenty thousand dollars. I know people that have gotten forty thousand, and they're the, a current friend right now who's getting a little bit more than that and I even know people that have gotten over a hundred thousand dollars to do a children's picture book so the reason for the title question of this video is how much should I charge for my art which is the wrong question is basically look at this little children's book here and if people can get from five hundred dollars to over a hundred thousand dollars how am I how is one person going to be able to tell you how much to charge I don't have enough information. I don't know enough about you to be able to give you a price. I don't know enough about your client to be able to give you a price. Um, let's take some examples here, okay? So let's look at this. Let's say that this here on the left is your client and this is you over here on the right and this is me with the stupid look on my face right there, okay? Let's say your client is thinking of a thousand dollars, right? So that's your client, and your client is thinking of paying you a thousand dollars, and asks you to do a children's book, and asks you how much you're going to charge me. And in your mind, you're thinking, well, the most or the least that I could do this for is probably about two thousand dollars. Then you ask me, Will, how much would you charge for this? And I, I ask you a few questions, maybe. You know, and I say, well, I don't know, maybe five thousand dollars. So now we're set up for a pretty good problem because if you trust me and I tell you, well, you know, I get paid nine, ten, twenty thousand dollars for mine, but where you might be a beginner, where this might be a small publisher, ask for five thousand. So if you ask for five thousand, guess what's probably going to happen? You're probably not going to hear again from that client. You'll probably email. Your, your your email to them that asks for five thousand dollars and then nothing 
And then you ask me, hey, this client never got back to me. Do you think we asked for too much? Yeah. But we're never going to know that. We're just going to know because you never got called back. What if you really, really wanted to do it? Your price right here wasn't far off from theirs. What if you had asked for 2000 like you were thinking? They would probably say, well, um, we were thinking more like 1000 What about 1500 You know, or 1200 You might actually still want to do it for that. And in that case, guess what? Instead of being upset, now you've got money coming in and some work that you want uh, that you wanted to do okay that's a scenario here's another scenario is let's say your client is thinking five thousand dollars right and let's say you're thinking again two thousand dollars I'm just throwing these numbers out these numbers are meaningless they could be you know they could be totally different and let's say I'm thinking you know what you're a beginner I know that on my first book I got a thousand dollars so I tell you, why don't you ask for a thousand dollars? Now we got another problem, totally reversed, because now when you ask for a thousand dollars, what happens? You you know you can already see it. You've left four thousand dollars on the table because this person right here is going to give you a resounding yes. They get to go back to their boss and say, we got so and so for a thousand dollars. We get to save that four thousand. I saved the company four thousand dollars. Maybe it's their own company. Maybe it's their own money. Maybe they're saving $4,000. So you're leaving tons of money on the table in that scenario, right? So that's a huge problem. So I want to talk about uh, kind of a better way to, um, to price your work. And before I do, I also want to mention that there's a book out there called The Pricing and Ethical Guidelines Book by the Graphic Artist Guild. Now I'm not going to say anything negative about this book because I don't want to go negative on this video. I'm not going to tell you anything about how much I hate this book or anything like that because again I don't want to be negative. But the problem with books and the problem with someone, a book is just going to give you prices. Prices to go to your client and ask for. And we could see from those last examples that either way that price is not going to be right because again if we go back, if I remind you of this first graphic um, and the amount of money that a children's book can can uh, bring in how in the world can a book tell you the price and I'll hear some people on on when I made this video the last time I got a lot of comments and messages from people saying well at least it gives us a range you know and I understand wanting a range you know everybody wants to feel comfortable we're scared of leaving tons of money on the table and we're scared of scaring off a client by asking for too much we want to feel confident. We want to feel safe in asking for a price. We want our price to mean something. We want to know what other people got so that we can feel confident. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem with that is it's a fantasy world. In fact, almost every industry has a book like that pricing book. Uh, my brother-in-law, who's a contractor, who's a carpenter, says they have a book in their industry and it is ridiculous because none of the prices are accurate because clients are all over the place and prices are all over the place um, to give you another an example of that let's talk about a commodity like a bottle of water how much is a bottle of water cost right so let's say that that bottle of water at the gas station might cost a dollar ninety nine what is that bottle of water actually worth right how much is that uh, worth and some people would say well it's worth a dollar ninety nine or other people say, well, it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. Um, I think it's interesting that if you take a dollar ninety-nine or whatever price it actually is, it doesn't have to be a dollar ninety-nine. But if you take this price, if you put that bottle of water on the counter and you're going to pay for it, did you realize that that bottle of water is actually worth more than your dollar ninety-nine, and it's worth less than a dollar ninety-nine to the person selling it to the to the owner of the gas station or wherever the the store that's selling it, and that's because the owner of the gas station didn't pay a dollar ninety-nine for that bottle of water. They probably paid, let's say, they paid maybe ninety-nine cents, and they're putting it out there. So it's definitely to them, uh, it's definitely worth less than a dollar ninety-nine. That's why they're willing to sell it for that, and it's definitely worth more than a dollar ninety-nine to you 
because you would rather have that bottle of water than your dollar ninety nine you're giving up your dollar ninety nine for that bottle of water right and you could say what if it was two dollars would you not buy it if it, if the price tag was two dollars one penny more would you go nope I'm not gonna buy it most people would still buy it proving again that that bottle of water is actually worth more than their dollar ninety nine now it's worth two dollars or two oh five or two ten or whatever right but another interesting thing to think about is what if you're, um, you know, in a different situation. Maybe you're the type of person who uh, would never ever buy a bottle of water because you're either, um, you know, you're you're Earth conscious and and you want to help save the planet and you don't want to add plastic to our to our garbage problem. So you don't buy bottled water, right? And so to you, it's even worth even far less, maybe. 75 cents or 25 cents or maybe it's worthless to you because you're just never gonna buy it right uh, what if though it's worth could it ever be worth even to someone who let's say let's say you're the type of person who would never buy a bottle of water or wouldn't it at least admit that you buy a bottle of water um, could it ever be worth 250 let's say you're late for work you just came from the gym you're dying of thirst you know you're going right into a meeting and there is no possibility of you getting any water and just this one time you're willing to pay for a bottle of water and it happens to be two dollars and fifty cents would you buy it a lot of people would right so now again that bottle of water which is has a fixed cost which has a fixed price of a dollar ninety nine you now pay more for right and there could even be a scenario where uh... you know you are stuck out in the desert or something and you've crawled your way back and now uh, there's almost no price you wouldn't pay for a bottle of water or a bunch of bottle of waters even if the store owner could see you crawling back and could say you know what I'm gonna gouge this person because there's no water in sight I'm the only place they're gonna get water and I'm gonna really charge them and they'll pay for it because they're dying of thirst right so the price goes up from there the problem is that even with commodities which have a fixed cost and you could take even things like pork bellies or or um, anything that's traded sugar uh, wheat anything like that <clears throat> that price is constantly fluctuating based on many things supply and demand the type of uh, weather that we've had the type of crop that's come in so just get into your brain that um, that the cost of, of goods and services is continually fluctuating and it's also uh, continually different for different people based on their needs and their wants and their desires and things like that um, because I want to talk about the next thing which is which questions uh, you really should <coughs> excuse me I'm sorry <coughs> be asking and that is uh, questions like why am I considering this project okay that's really what you should be asking yourself and to me there are five reasons okay there's five uh, reasons why you should consider a project in fact let me write those down before we get going here um, just to list them out for you I should have been ready for that and they are uh, money fun and some of these could be considered the same thing I guess in some ways portfolio experience those could maybe be one and the same and service okay okay so the first one is money and that's pretty obvious right most of us would work or do work for money right so that's like the major motivator so there are some people that actually hate their job but they love the money they make or maybe they don't even love the money they make but they have to to get along and so they wouldn't do that job if it wasn't for the money the second one is fun some people will actually work a, a job that uh, that pays really low because it's so much fun and they love their job and they love where they get to work so some people might take on a job in illustration just for the fun of it um, the third one is portfolio maybe 
your motivation is that you really, really, really want uh, the, the project to be in your portfolio at the end of the day, and it's worth it to take less money and for the project to be less fun, just to be able to have that printed um, project in their portfolio. Um, I put experience as a different category just because maybe it's not going in your portfolio, maybe you're not thinking it, it's gonna be good enough to make it in your portfolio, but you really wanna get that real world experience, and so maybe that's a motivator. And then the last one is service, and I hear this one all the time where people will say, um, you know, I really don't want to do this project, but my sister, my aunt, my mother, my grandmother, my friend, insert whoever it is, my dad, my uncle, my cousin, um, really, really wants me to do this. This is a story that he told when he was a kid, and he really wants me to do it, whatever the reason is. Um, so sometimes service is a motivator for some people. They're not making enough money, or they don't think they're going to make enough money. It's not fun. It's probably not going to go in their portfolio, but they're doing it to help someone else out. Personally, now this is a personal thing. I actually think that service is probably one of the worst reasons to do art for someone else. And not that service in general is not a good thing because I totally believe in service and I totally believe in helping people with their projects and stuff. The problem with doing art as a service project is often it is it kills you inside creatively to where you can't do your best work and so you disappoint yourself you disappoint your friend and um, it is extremely difficult to work on the project because you're hating it. and I have again I've talked to so many people that are like and this is they'll say things like my aunt really wants me to do this and she's telling me like that the characters have to look this way or or that they don't look right you know and I'm, I'm thinking well this is the way I draw and they're trying to art direct me but they're not really an artist and they're not really an editor and they don't really know so much and so but they're telling me all these things that I'm supposed to do and so I'm really worried that it's this is you know this is becoming a real nightmare project they almost always do so that's why I say service is is a bad one if you want to help someone go over to their house and cut their lawn or bake them make them dinner or clean their house or do something um, but I personally I think that art is it usually ends up going south on you if you use that as a um, as a service project okay so but I'm not you you're not me so it could be different okay so let's talk about um, where you actually want to be um, hitting because I feel like this is kind of a graph and so I made this little chart this little uh, baseball diamond right so in baseball everybody wants to hit a home run and so the home run zone is somewhere out here so there could be a lot of reasons why you take a project but my um, my advice to you is make sure you take on a project where you can hit a home run okay and home runs look very different sometimes home runs are all about the money you know or mostly about the money um, and sometimes projects are more about how fun it is, you know, so and not about the money at all. And maybe they're about portfolio or maybe they're a good mixture, you know, um, where the money's decent and the, the enjoyability is decent. I think this is the zone right here that you want to try to avoid. I hate this project. I hate what I'm working on and I'm not getting paid anything, then why are you doing it? That's what I think most of us want to avoid. You know, I'm getting 500 bucks, even out here. I guess I don't mind working on this. Well, guess what? You probably will by the time you get to the end of it. Um, so that's basically my advice with pricing is it's not about, um, it's, it's just definitely not about uh, asking someone how much to charge or finding out the perfect price because you probably won't be able to now let's look at the last thing on the list and that is actually coming up with your bottom line so let's turn these off here and let's talk about that uh, so the question that I would ask uh, everybody that's that's watching this uh, to ask themselves is aside from you know why are you going to do this project what is your motivation is you know what is your bottom line
what is my bottom line let's go back to uh, the client okay <clears throat> and you and me we'll leave me out of it but let's talk about you okay so what I would say is let's say that you um, are gonna hate this project right so you're you know right away that what you're being asked to do is gonna suck really bad okay so you figure out that in order to do this project the least amount of money you would be willing to take is and let's say let's let's I'm, I keep using a children's book because I'm a children's book illustrator so let's say we're just talking about a children's book and let's say and everybody's in a different place you know some people are in other countries uh, where the cost of living is a lot lower than here in the US and let's say three thousand dollars right three thousand dollars is a lot of money to some people and it's not a lot of money to others but we're gonna stick with that for right now let's say and you can insert whatever amount of money for the project but let's say that um, this person right here is willing to do this for three thousand dollars and that is it I mean like and so what I would ask is as as if we role played this out you know and I've I've done this with students before um, and with with um, acquaintances is I, I ask them tell me what the lowest amount of money you would be willing to take to do this project now remember you hate doing this one so on the scale of I hate this or I love this and why are you doing it motivation this project is a hate project and you're just doing it for the money right so this is the motivator so I would say are you would you be willing to do this for 2500 not do you want 2500 but really think your client asks you hey guess what you asked for 3000 I'm willing to pay you 2500 what do you say okay and you have to know you have to you have to envision that you have to imagine it uh, you have to role play it in your mind before you ever have this conversation with your client um, and you have to try to figure out where your bottom line is. I can tell you that I've had projects before where um, I was offered, I, I didn't, I wasn't offered at first. I was asked to submit a price, figured out the amount of work, and I just thought with what I have on my plate right now, I could be, I would be willing to do this project for, and, it, and it, I'm thinking of one in particular that was three illustrations, and I said, you know, I'd be willing to do this project for $2,500, but nothing less than that because of the complexity of the assignment it wasn't horribly complex but it was complex enough that if the client did not have twenty five hundred dollars right so this is me if the client didn't have twenty five hundred dollars I'm walking I'm saying nope get somebody else to do it if they come in with twenty four hundred dollars I am happy with a smile on my face to say go find someone else because I'm going to ask this client for thirty five hundred dollars right I'm willing to go down to this my this is my bottom line right here okay let's forget about the twenty four hundred dollars right now I am willing to go to twenty five you asked me for twenty four ninety and I mean it you're calling my bluff at that point you know because if they say if I say thirty five hundred and they come back at twenty four ninety or whatever and I say I'll do it for twenty five hundred dollars if they blink and go 2490 or they wouldn't do that but they'd say 2400 like no I'm, I'm happy to let it go at that point okay the reason that I'm over explaining this is that I had someone one time that I advised to do this in this exact situation and this uh, this woman who contacted me from the internet said how should I price and I went through this is before I made the other video too this is this is many years ago and I went through this whole thing and I said you gotta figure out your bottom line you got to figure out where your walking point is, where your pain point is, you know. Um, and she said, okay, I, I got that. I said, okay, well then I would tack on, I usually don't double this figure right here, my bottom line. I wouldn't usually go up to five, but you could. It would be silly to take this up to like 7,500 or something like that. Because then your price is meaningless if you're willing to go back to 2,500. You've got to have a price that's kind of in the same ballpark a little bit so that if you come down, you don't look silly, right? So I told this this woman who asked me, 
you know, what is your bottom line? She said, okay, well, my bottom line is, and I think if I recall, it was somewhere around $2,000. And she asked for 3000 or 3500 and she never got called back by the client. She just never got an email or anything. It was just dead silent. And she emailed me back really upset. She says, you told me to ask for this amount of money. I would have done it for a lot less. I'm like, you didn't understand what I was telling you then. You didn't tell them your bottom line. If you were willing to do it for less than 2000 then that's your bottom line. So if you're willing to do it for 1000 then 1000 is your bottom line. If you're willing to do it for 500 then 500 is your bottom line. You've got to find out what the lowest amount of money so that you're happy to say no when they go below that number, okay? And then you add to that and ask for more. Now, are you going to is there a potential for you to leave money on the table? Absolutely. If your client is thinking $5,000, right? And you're thinking my bottom line is 2500, I'm going to ask for 3500. If you ask for 3500, guess what? You left $1500 on the table. If they say yes, and that you'll never know about that. You'll never know, right? But um, that's okay because guess what? At 3500, you're probably pretty happy, right? Because you got $1000 more than your bottom line. And this works if you're pricing large amounts of money or you know, like uh, a lot of the books that I do are over ten thousand dollars it works in that range too the general generally the larger publishers will have a fixed amount of money that they're just offering and they'll tell you that up front this is more for um, a lot of um, independent clients um, people that are asking you directly uh, maybe they're startup companies or smaller companies but in the when I used to do a lot of advertising work that's how everything was done this way and in fact I could tell you stories where I actually got in I I, I've actually used a little, I wouldn't call it trickery, but um, a little bit of um, interrogation, you might say, to find out what the client was willing to pay. I'll tell you one. Um, there was a big job that I was working for, and I'm, I can't tell you the, the name of the client, but it was, a, uh, it was a board game that we were working on, and for a pretty big company, the one that everybody's heard of, and this was a long time ago. And uh, uh, the my my rep at the time, we didn't know how much to charge for this project. And so, actually, I'm sorry, I mis I misquoted the wrong project. This was a project for a, a candy company, a big candy company. And um, we didn't know how much to charge for this for this project. It was the a, a campaign for um, for Halloween that would go in all the grocery stores in the country. Anyway. Um, we guessed in our minds talking to each other what we thought the client would be willing to pay. I was worried because it was such a big job and it was so much money, it was well into the five figure range that we were going to leave a lot of money on the table. And they had a separate art buyer and they had a separate uh, graphic designer. And so the art buyer is skilled in telling you um, and not telling you and not giving out information not telling you how much they have because the art buyer is savvy and probably has a business background or business degree um, and so uh, the art buyer told me send us your bid send us your the amount of money you're gonna charge us to do this thing we got all the specs we got everything faxed to us this is back in the day with fax machines um, and so we got all that information and we looked at it and we tried to figure out how much would they be willing to pay and we came up with a figure Okay, and the figure was was higher than we even thought we should even ask for. But then we started thinking, well, it's possible that they have even more than that. This is a huge project. It's going to take at least a month to do, um, working full time, and ad agencies pay a lot of money. So I got lucky. I'm, I'm not going to say that it was just me being savvy, but I got lucky. The the graphic designer called me, wanting to get me started on the project, wanting to get going, and what I said it just popped into my head was you know sh this is a different person than the art buyer I'll just ask her maybe she'll give up the money and so I said hey do you know about where you guys are on this project because um, we don't wanna we want our bid to reflect about you know your budget and she without missing a beat just gave me the whole budget and it was ten thousand dollars more than we were going to ask for and so guess what when we faxed in our bid, it, it reflected that extra $10,000, and that was how we made a lot of money 
with one phone call. So, <clears throat> anyway, that's the best thing. The best thing you can ever do is get that information because without that, you're going to probably inevitably leave money on the table. But with this system of actually um, finding out what your bottom line is, you can walk away pretty confident that at least you're happy. And another thing that I might mention too is that your bottom line is going to fluctuate. And this is another reason why the pricing book is no good. Because let's say that you are, um, you you don't have any work one month, right? You, I mean, like you're destitute. You've got your rent due, you've got your electric bill due, whatever. And you're really worried about money. Well, now under this scenario, you're going to be really afraid to ask for too much money because you don't want to lose that job, right? So let's say your bottom line was $2,500, but let's say now you just need to make rent and you cannot afford to lose this job. You might ask for $2,000 and be really, excuse me, really happy to get it at $2,000 or even $1,500 because you just want them to hire you. You don't want there to be any chance that you're asking for way too much money, right? Juxtapose that with the fact that let's say you do have a lot of work and this has happened to me a lot of times where I've been in both situations where I don't have enough work or I have way too much work and a lot of times when I have way too much work I will ask for two, three, even four times what I have gotten in the past because I don't want the job and I have, I have an ulterior motive. One, I want to ask for a lot more money so that if I don't get it the client thinks that wow, there are there are illustrators out there that are getting a lot more money for jobs, you know, and maybe I'm really paying low. I'm, other videos I've talked about this, where prices for illustrators have stayed the same from back in the uh, the early 1900s, where but inflation has gone up this whole time, right? Um, or I guess it's like that. Um, and so every year we lose a little bit of ground. So I feel like. I, if, if I'm really flushed with work and I have tons of work, I can, if I ask for more work or ask for more money and I don't get it, then I'm fine because that might push prices up. But even better than that is, let's say I ask for four times the money and they say yes. Well, now I'm staying up till two in the morning, but I'm getting paid four times as much as I normally would have. So I'm happy because we're going to have money to maybe buy something extra or pay off something or do you know something or go on a trip or something. So um, those are things to think about. And I also want to just throw in a pitch real quick for our SVS. This is one of the lessons that we taught in our business class um, for the children's book class. And we talk about things like this and we go over things um, that are business related um, for our students. And there's a link down below for that, um, svslearn.com. But anyway, I hope this helps you pricing your illustrations. Um, and I hope to see you on my next video. If you like what you saw, go ahead and subscribe. If you don't like what you saw, don't subscribe. See you on my next video.